Russia's war on Ukraine continues, with President Zelensky making another plea for arms to help his country. The US and its EU allies have bolstered his military, enabling it to fight back, but critics say that more weapons just means that more people will die. Is further military aid for Ukraine the way forward? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought war between two European countries on a scale not seen since World War II. Death and destruction has been extensive, but Russia has been met with stiff resistance and Ukrainian forces have also retaken some territory. Western arms and training have played a key role, forcing Russia to reassess its tactics. Moscow is now switching to long-range weapons and drones. Some critics of Western strategy say that pouring more arms into a war simply means more death and delays the need to talk peace. We'll be discussing all of this with our guests very shortly, but first, this report from Charles Stratford in Ukraine on the latest wave there of Russian attacks. Torchlight guides shoppers along the shelves. Russia's almost nightly bombardment of Ukraine's electricity and energy infrastructure means millions of Ukrainians spend much of their daily life in the dark. Victoria is shopping with her three-year-old son, Daniel. They fled fighting near their home in the Kherson region in April. The authorities tell us they've stabilised the electricity situation and then there's another attack. It's been like this for the last two months. <laughs> He's got used to the darkness, and importantly, he's not afraid. We have no choice. We have to get through this. Emergency services battled fires across Kiev and various locations throughout the country after another Russian bombardment early Monday morning. This home was completely destroyed in a village close to Kiev by one of 30 so-called kamikaze drones the Ukrainian military says it intercepted. We got used to what is happening. It's scary. Thoughts of possibly becoming homeless is terrifying. Everyone is scared, but we are bearing it. Maria and Denise have to carry their two-and-a-half-year-old son David up the stairs to their apartment on the 13th floor because electricity is down again, so the elevator doesn't work. Ten days after the invasion, as Russian forces advanced towards their apartment block in Irpin, they fled to the Netherlands and then France. They have only recently returned. Maria comforts her son in bed as she tries to send him to sleep. Denise has put plastic sheeting over the windows for additional protection against the sub-zero winter temperatures. It's pretty hard, but we try not to complain because we think of our soldiers living in the trenches in dismal conditions. But on one occasion, we didn't have electricity for two days. Yes, it's cold. Sometimes the child is coughing. It's winter. But we can get through this. We wait for spring and victory. Nearby is one of thousands of heated tents with generators put up in recent weeks where people can get warm and charge their devices as work continues around the clock to fully restore electricity and heating across the country. Russia's drone and missile attacks targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure are happening with increasing frequency. And that means that many people in neighbourhoods like this one face another night without heating and in the dark. Charles Stratford, Al Jazeera, Kyiv. While Western military aid has been critical to Ukraine's resistance and military advances, let's take a closer look at some of the numbers. In total, more than 30 countries have provided military equipment to Ukraine. The US has contributed the most by far, with at least $8.5 billion in military aid. Next on the list is Germany, which has given far less, just over $2.34 billion. And the United Kingdom follows, supplying weapons worth $1.9 billion. But Ukraine's president has appealed for more funding, saying that the monthly cost of defence is about $5 billion. I ask you to increase the supply of air defence systems to our country and help speed up the relevant decisions of partners. 
100% air defense shield for Ukraine would be one of the most successful steps against Russian aggression. This step is needed right now. Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by all of our guests in Kyiv. We have Peter Zalmayev. He is the executive director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. In Moscow, we have Pavel Felgenhauer. He's a defense and military analyst. And in Riga, Latvia, is Leonid Rogozin, uh, an independent journalist and publisher of a book called European Tragedy, a history of Russia and the current conflict. A warm welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us here on Inside Story. We know that Kyiv has been coming under renewed attacks in recent days, so I'll start there. Peter, presumably you'd like to see more Western weapons then to help defend your city? Well, indeed, and this, this is something that we've been obviously warning about since at least October uh, the 10th, which is the, the day when the first such strikes occurred. You know, we are hearing very positive signals from Washington that the Patriot air defense system uh, may finally be given to Ukraine. This should have been done weeks, if not months ago, and it will still take uh, a while to train Ukrainians to use it because uh, America cannot send its own technicians to operate them or soldiers that that would be considered as uh, uh, participation, direct participation in the war. Uh, but this is a very encouraging sign in Europe. The West has uh, finally realized that, um, you know, uh, Ukraine's defeat will be its own defeat, that another, you know, tens of, uh, let's say, millions of refugees flooding over uh, the borders to Europe will overwhelm these societies, will create a significant uh, uh, problem for uh, these uh, governments. So, uh, you know, they need to do everything they can uh, to help Ukrainians defend themselves from this mm -hmm. terror from the sky that's been rained on us for weeks, weeks and weeks. Right now I'm sitting in Kiev, I'm lucky to have power on, but 80% of the Kiev region at large is sitting now without power and some of them without water. Well, just picking up on that, uh, Russia has obviously been accused of weaponizing winter. It's sub-zero temperatures there. We've been seeing attacks on energy infrastructure. Uh, I know some defense analysts have been suggesting that this might be a, a Russian strategy to try to wear down um, Ukraine's air defense capability because it, it takes so many arms in order to try to defend itself. Uh, Pavel, do you think that's the Russian plan here? Well, the Russian military have a very substantial upper hand in that they have capabilities to hit any target in any part of Ukraine, long range capabilities that Ukraine does not. But the problem with this long range uh, attack arm of the Russian military is that they can hit only stationary targets and big targets. They can't hit uh, mobile targets like say convoys or trains bringing uh, reinforcements and weapons to the to the front line and from the west, uh, because Russian bombers don't venture to fly deep into Ukraine at all. That means these are long-range missiles that hit uh, stationary targets. The most easy stationary target are the Ukrainian grid system, that me and also defense industry. And also military camps, but basically right now it's the electricity power stations, but not, of course, uh, the uh, uh, nuclear ones, but, uh, the, those that, uh, but the, those that are producing electric power, hoping that uh, denying electric power to Ukraine will put enough pressure on the Ukrainian government to seek a peaceful solution, to seek a ceasefire. Russia right now very much needs a ceasefire. Uh, for well, several years at least, but a ceasefire on Russian terms. So this is how they're putting pressure. We, they can do it and they are doing it. Well, if they're trying to put pressure on it, it seems to be backfiring somewhat because these attacks have only really strengthened morale. We've seen that in, in quite a lot of the polling that's been coming out of Kyiv. I know Ukrainians are saying, the majority of them, that they're resolved to now fight until victory. So trying to end the war, especially at this point, seems to be not the, not the aim here. Ukrainians feel like they're making gains. They want the war to continue. Leonid, let me throw this to you. That sounds like an argument for more weapons from the West then. Well, I suppose so. And it's, uh, it's not inconceivable that uh, more weapons uh, 
supplied by the West to Ukraine will result in uh, success on the battlefields and and um, Ukraine being able to recapture at least the territory that was captured by Russia after February 24th, after the start of the full-out uh, invasion. Uh, however, it is equally not inconceivable that uh, there will be no success and uh, that the um, um, missile strikes against the Ukrainian uh, uh, power grid will result in something akin to a humanitarian uh, catastrophe mm -hmm. uh, towards, uh, towards the end or towards the middle of the winter. Um, so it's, it's a very, very complicated uh, equation uh, that um, intelligence services and uh, the military um, uh, in Western countries uh, need to solve uh, and to, to make a very uh, accurate forecast because the, the cost of an accurate forecast is, is human lives and uh, many, many human lives, thousands and thousands. Of course. Uh, it's also not just more weapons, I believe, that Kiev is asking for, but also more sophisticated weaponry. Uh, is there potentially a risk, do you think, Pavel, of an escalation into potentially NATO territory if more sophisticated weapons are sent? Uh, well, Ukraine is asking for sophisticated weapons. It's getting sophisticated weapons uh, since the war began in the end of February. Uh, the Ukrainian military now have capabilities they didn't have in the beginning of the war, and capabilities, with, uh, some of them, that Russia also does not have. And that has changed the overall balance in the beginning or the first half of this conflict up to the midsummer, maybe. Russia had the initiative and the upper hand, though there were many mistakes made and uh, many disasters happened, but still, now the equation has changed. Now Ukraine has the initiative to some extent, and that's right means that there's going to be more fighting and the fighting will get more severe. Maybe actually next month we'll see a major winter battle developing there. At least that's what many military mm -hmm. experts in Russia and in Ukraine are predicting. And this may be a decisive battle for the future of this part of the world. Or maybe not, of course, we don't know for sure. But both sides are gearing up for that mm -hmm. conflict coming up and gathering reserves. Uh, Pavel, it sounds like you're talking about an escalation there. So let me ask you, Peter, as someone sitting in Kiev now, is there a concern that more weapons could result in a further escalation, potentially even raise the nuclear threat? I mean, obviously, some threats were made back in October. Well, the nuclear threat is something that we I would prefer to sort of uh, bracket simply because we just, uh, you know, this is uh, the doomsday scenario mm. none, none wants to contemplate. It seems plausible that the Chinese uh, counterparts have made it clear to Vladimir Putin in recent meetings that they will not countenance the use of nuclear weapons. And so that uh, is being relied on as a potential deterrent. Obviously, there's no guarantee uh, of that. Uh, but if we simply just do not consider that, if we're talking about conventional weaponry, like I'm not a military expert, uh, but uh, you know, when we talk about escalation, that to Ukrainian ears at least sounds a little ridiculous. We're in the midst of uh, the biggest uh, European land-based war since World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia is already doing all it can to uh, to terrorize us, uh, Vladimir Putin has made very clear his goal, and that is the disappearance of Ukraine as a sovereign entity, as a state. You know, sometimes the Western audience or worldwide audience does not understand the implications, does not, does not understand the message. I mean, all you have to do is just uh, understand some Russian to tune into these federal TV channels uh, and to, to hear every day uh, uh, these uh, calls for Ukrainians to be exterminated, for Ukrainian children to be drowned in rivers. This is third, uh, third Reich rhetoric. This is what Hitler said about Jews. There's really no difference. This is a genocidal war. And, uh, you know, yet I agree with Pavel, the future of the rest of the 21st century and our security um, architecture is being decided in Ukraine. I think, Peter, and I hope the West understands, sure, simply there's obviously cannot a, afford to Ukraine go. There's obviously a lot of rhetoric flying around, but I do want to ask you a, a very basic question, which I'm sure a lot of our viewers are trying to work out at the moment. I think fundamentally people see more weapons being sent and they presume that that will mean the fighting will continue for longer. And as a result, the fighting continues, more lives are lost, 
and there's more destruction of your country. And there's obviously been hundreds of billions of dollars worth of destruction already, and you're living through and suffering through all of that now. Is there the appetite for that to continue? Is there not a worry that, that this will just go on indefinitely? Well, if weapons are not being sent to Ukraine, then that means capitulation of Ukraine. And that's not an option to us who are Ukrainians and who do not want to be a part of Russia. Uh, you know, 98% of Ukrainians now want restoration to 1991 borders. When we talk about this kind of weaponry and long range missiles, that would be uh, uh, giving Ukraine symmetrical ability to strike at military targets inside mm -hmm. Russia, including those missile launchers from the Caspian Sea, mm -hmm. which Russia is using to terrorize civilians and that's what we're talking about okay i want to broaden this out a little bit because this is a war that's obviously had huge impacts not just on ukraine but also many other countries around the globe when it comes to food security energy prices um, economic crises and in, in various different places uh, could more weapons do you think leonid prolong the suffering for everyone and, and might that give other countries the impetus to try to resolve this in a different way well, um, again, I would say that uh, that depends on the uh, accuracy of the forecasts associated with the supplies of those weapons. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if, if this war drags on uh, for, for a long time, then yes, uh, there will be uh, an impact on, on, the whole, uh, on the whole world, on the, um, on the European economy and on the, on the economy um, globally. Um, so I'm sure that uh, Western governments are taking this into uh, consideration. And then uh, also, yes, there is uh, the um, uh, nuclear risk, which should not be exaggerated. Uh, however, we are talking about a very uh, non-transparent uh, group, a very small group that is ruling Russia, that is controlling uh, this huge uh, arsenal of nuclear weapons, which is uh, capable of destroying entire humanity, really. Um, so it, it should be a concern for humanity. Um, so, um, yes, on the one hand, uh, it is a just cause to uh, arm and support Ukraine, uh, but also all these uh, considerations uh, uh, regarding the, the, the future of, of the world, recently, uh, really, or the future of humanity, uh, should be also taken into account. We don't know whether uh, Putin uh, is a suicidal person and whether he's anti rush are suicidal as well. Okay, I want to turn to some of the pressure that's been mounting on different Western countries involved here, particularly the US. I, I see that just in the last few weeks, Russia pulled out of the New START treaty talks, the, the, um, their agreement to reduce nuclear arms, and they're trying to ramp up pressure clearly on Washington in order to stop supporting Ukraine. Pavel, do you think that's working at all? Well, Russia is using, of course, the nuclear deterrent uh, fully as a deterrent. That's for what nuclear weapons were made, to use them as a deterrent, meaning to, to in plain words, that's nuclear uh, blackmail. Uh, but the, the difference between using them as a deterrent and using them, actually using them, that's, well, that, that's the so-called nuclear threshold, and it is very high. So right now, it doesn't seem that anyone would want to go over that threshold, because that goes both ways. If you use nuclear weapons, you're going to receive nuclear weapons from the other side, sure. because both sides have the deterrence there. So that's a kind of, this uh, nuclear deterrence that Russia is using against uh, the West is modifying the Western support for Ukraine. Ukraine is not getting long-range uh, missiles to attack deep into Russia, and most likely won't, because that is seen as too provocative. Hmm. Ukraine is getting battlefield weapons, most likely defense weapons uh, to against Russian long-range attacks like anti-missile, anti-aircraft additional capabilities, uh, which will more or less keep the situation as it is for or something like that. Sure. Uh, the Sorry, coming I'm... battles of the water. Yes. I, I just want to bring in PISA here because we're talking about the U.S. continuing to send weapons to Ukraine as. Kiev and, and Zelensky have requested. But I'm curious, Pisa, at what point do you see those weapons stop? Because President Biden, at some point in March, he had some unscripted remarks that hinted at regime change in the Kremlin. But we've really had no clear objective from the US in terms of, of what they want to achieve here. So if you're sending weapons to Ukraine and you're the US, at what point do you stop? 
Well, you know, I think it has a momentum of its own, you know, contrary to fears, uh, initial fears that the uh, Trump Republican controlled Congress cut uh, aid to Ukraine drastically. It hasn't happened. The Trump wing of the party hasn't uh, really had much of a showing. Uh, and meanwhile, you know, the military industrial complex uh, of the U.S. is ramping up uh, its uh, production capacity. Its budget has been increased uh, by Congress. So um, the momentum is still to continue mm -hmm. this uh, support of Ukraine, not without issues, not without problems and qualifications, but until 2024, until the new presidential elections, I think the inertia will uh, maintain simply sure. because um, speaking of the population, speaking of uh, just public opinion, uh, the support of Ukraine in the U.S. remains overwhelming. Well, there is also public support for peace talks in various different places, so I want to turn to that. Um, Moscow has a narrative that Ukraine is the one that doesn't want to negotiate, but from what I understand, Russia is demanding that Ukraine recognize geopolitical realities, I say that with quotation marks, before coming to the table. So, by my understanding, in order to sit down, Moscow requires Kyiv to make concessions. Leonid, is that essentially giving things away before you even start negotiating? Well, the, the, the way I see it, um, uh, the strategic goal uh, of the Kremlin is to essentially to punish Ukraine for uh, refusing to implement Minsk agreements and to, to punish it in general for being intransigent. So in that sense, um, it doesn't really um, matter for the Kremlin, I think, um, what, uh, what, what percentage of the territory it currently controls will be left to it um, after, uh, after the settlement. What's, what's important for them, I think, is that uh, Ukraine uh, loses uh, more than it had before February 24. And that, uh, that I'm sure, includes uh, the control of uh, the, um, the parts of Lugansk and Donetsk regions that Russia currently controls. And, and also for Russia, it will be very um, difficult to part with the land corridor to Crimea, uh, which they have gained by seizing Mariupol and Berdyansk. Uh, but all the rest is, I think, negotiable for the Kremlin. And uh, any, um, any solution that will uh, involve keeping uh, those parts of Lugansk and Donetsk regions and uh, the land corridor to Crimea, um, all of this can be presented by the Kremlin as a victory at the end of the day. Of course. Uh, well, one of the most powerful arguments that I've heard for making the West to continue its support of Ukraine has been around precedent. So they're saying, well, a number of analysts are saying that Western powers need to stay the course to continue providing weapons and not necessarily push for peace talks right now because what you want to do is prevent future escalation on the next crisis. Otherwise, Moscow is really presented a blueprint for not only Russia, but for other potential powers to get what they want from the West. Pavel, what do you make of that argument? Well, many in the West, especially in Europe, would want to see a ceasefire happening. And Moscow wants a ceasefire uh, right now because uh, the Ukrainian right now have more men in, in their armed forces and in many cases have more weapons. And Russia right now is struggling to replace uh, the weapons and munitions we're using up, the intensity of the fighting is high, and I don't think that Russia can continue for a long time. Mm -hmm. Moscow well, Ukraine also wants to cease fire, but again, it's about the terms. Sure. Uh, what Russia wants a freeze of what it is more or less a freeze of uh, the status quo for the time being, a line of control established, a kind mm -hmm. of Minsk three. Ukraine is not ready for that. And that means, uh, and the West is not ready to put any kind of real pressure on Ukraine, though, of course, they're holding back, say, uh, long range uh, missiles that could be used from the high Mars system for 300 kilometers. The Americans are not giving that, and the others are also not giving it because these, these missiles are in other NATO countries. So there is some pressure on the Ukrainians, but no one wants to be seen as the one who forces the Ukrainians into a capitulation. So right now, I believe both sides actually have enough weapons there on the battlefield for one more very vicious battle coming up in the winter. Then there's going to be spring, and that means a lot of mud, and there's going to be a pause, and mm -hmm. then there's going to be summer, 
by summer maybe we'll have a ceasefire, maybe not. It depends how the coming battles turn out on the battlefield. That's where the decision is going to be made. Indeed, and we'll continue watching that all very closely here on Al Jazeera. But for now, thank you to all of our guests, uh, Peter Zalmayev, Leonid Rogozin and Pavel Fel Felgenhauer, thanks so much for joining us and thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, that's aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Anastasia Tay and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.